I am deeply honored to have this opportunity to speak with you and share some thoughts about the tremendous cognitive dissidence in Islamic values, the beautiful values that I was taught as a kid and their disconnect with my past consumption habits and currently the general Muslim population's consumption habits, particularly when it comes to consuming animals. I'm sure we can all agree that our mindless consumption is causing unspeakable suffering to animals, our environment, and the most marginalized people on our planet. I find it hardest, and this may just be my personal experience, but I find it very difficult to reach my fellow Muslims with the vegan message. And that's because we are mostly convinced that eating animals is not only approved, but part and parcel of the Islamic religion. This label provides the illusion of divine permission. And I will make a case for the main arguments that this is not in fact the case. And in my opinion, veganism is most aligned with Islamic values. Now, we all know the data. Dr. Philip went over it as well. We know that we have raised so much land, we've destroyed so much habitat that it equals the size of the entire continent of Africa. So we can feed the cow that we eat instead of feeding hungry children. We know that UN reports on climate change repeatedly encourage people to stop eating meat and dairy, but then they serve animals at their conferences. We know that 75% of, of diseases are zoonotic. And despite all these facts, despite us watching the world burn and flood, we still carry on. The halal certification, which makes wealthy people extremely, extremely wealthy, is not grounded in Islamic values. It is grounded in capitalism. Like so many evils in our world, it comes down to money and power. The Quran tells us not to cause corruption and destruction and ruin on earth. However, meat and dairy factory farming is the leading cause of habitat destruction, water depletion, deforestation, species extinction, and ocean dead zones. This is a direct quote from the Quran. And do good as Allah has been good to you and do not seek to cause destruction on the earth. Allah does not love the corruptors. Here's another one. And it is he who has made you successors upon the earth and has raised some of you above others in degrees that he may try you through what he has given you. Indeed, your Lord is swift in penalty, but indeed he is forgiving and merciful. Our consumption habits are killing the earth. Our actions do not align with the instructions in the Quran that tell us to be mindful and compassionate. It is true that it says in the Quran that it is permissible to eat animals. However, it is never advised that we eat animals. 1400 years ago, living in a food desert, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, barely ate animals. It is a popular belief that he was mostly vegetarian and ate only when hungry, fasting often. There, was no, there were no grocery stores, no import export the way we have today. Without eating animals in the desert, there would be certain death. Here's another quote from the Quran. Indeed, we offered the trust to the heavens and the earth and the mountains, and they declined to bear it and feared it. But man undertook to bear it. Indeed, he was unjust and ignorant. Corruption doth appear on land and sea because of the evil which men's hands have done, that he may make them taste a part of that which they have done in order that they may return. There weren't enough humans on the planet 1400 years ago to have drummed up the destruction we have currently. It is theorized that people would cut off parts of live animals. So Quranic instruction, similar to the concept of kosher, is the concept of halal. It regulated the method of slaughter to a more humane one. Islam also regulated slavery and limited marrying multiple wives to four. Weird things were happening in society at that time, as they're still happening today. And people weren't just going to stop certain norms at that time. So many instructions in Islam 
gently guide to the most ethical option possible. Even though there wasn't a direct rule to outlaw slavery, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, advised on the rights of the slaves at the time and regularly sent his companions to buy slaves at the market to set them free. Similarly, men were and often married tons of women. So the Quran set a limit to four, but only if the man could treat them each equally, which is nearly impossible. And it was a big ask for that time to limit to four. The point is there are lessons and nuances that carry over the span of time and advancements. Most Muslims realize that having slaves is unethical and marrying multiple women is not a healthy situation in most cases. We have evolved quite a bit as a society and we still have a long way to go, but the lessons from Islam remain relevant. Halal, the word simply means permissible. Here's what halal certification looks for today. These are rules directly taken from the website of the Halal Monitoring Committee in the UK. You'll see down here, it speaks about the following, describes some of the key criteria for halal adopted by HMC. Animal is alive and healthy prior to slaughter, mandatory recitation, swift and humane incision, compliance check during three or four, three or four main vessels are cut. That is all that is based on the halal criteria today. Halal rules actually include not tying down animals, natural feed and diet, a free life for the animal. The animals have right to medical care, Islamically speaking, and have a right to food and water until their last dying breath. They cannot be killed in front of each other. They cannot see blood, smell blood. There can't be artificial insemination and the calf always has first right to their mother's milk before anyone can take some of their own for their own consumption. With these rules, 99.9% .9 of the animal meat and dairy production today is rendered non-permissible. I have never seen the actual rules of how animals are supposed to be treated in Islam ever practiced in any of the Muslim countries I've lived in or visited. They have less factory farm settings, but the cruelty I have seen in the open air markets and slaughters conducted on the side of the road do not meet these rules. The animals are often watching in terror as their community members are killed in front of them. Speaking of community, it says in the Quran, there is not an animal that lives on the earth nor a being that flies on its wings, but they form communities like you. Nothing have we omitted from the book and they shall all be gathered to their Lord in the end. It is astounding to me that our Muslim leadership is so silent on veganism, animal rights, and the environment. We are a religion full of stories that exemplify that an act of kindness to an animal can send a corrupt soul to heaven, whilst a single act of cruelty to an animal by a pious Muslim can destine them to hell. One, one uh, authentic saying from uh, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is that he said, all creatures are like a family of God and he loves the most those who are the most beneficent to his family. I asked in an online Muslim vegan group once what it was about our Islamic faith that corresponded with the vegan lifestyle for them. The organizer of this group responded and his comment struck such a chord with me that I wanted to share it with you. And I share it often to be frank because it really left a mark. He said, what really struck a chord with me in all my research was that the prophet's soft heart towards all living things, even birds, ants, and trees. He smiled at everyone. We lack this as a community whereby we see tenderness and mercy and smiling as signs of weakness. I also saw how meticulous our faith was in terms of even hurting an animal's feelings or unnecessarily stressing them out. Scholars 1200 years ago wrote books on how one should cut their fingernails when milking their animals as to not hurt them. They wrote extensively about how your animal's need for water comes before your evolution for prayer, or that calves have first right to their mother's milk, and we can only take some of what's left over, but not completely exhaust the mother's supply. I mean, what sort of incredible legacy and environment cultivated such sages and pioneers in animal welfare? The one of Prophet Muhammad, mercy to all the world's peace and blessings upon him. 
it is said that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, he who takes piety on a sparrow and spares its life, Allah will be merciful on him on the day of judgment. And that do not allow your boys to tie up birds in order to kill them. For I heard the messenger of Allah forbidding the tying up of animals or other creatures in order to kill them. These are both considered uh, authentic hadith, which are the sayings of the prophet. Many Muslims ask about Eid al-Adha, the Eid where Muslims the world over slaughter a cow or goat and share the meat with their neighbors and distribute it to the poor. In today's context, with almost 2 billion Muslims in the world, it is an extremely cruel practice and it damages the environment significantly as well. Based on the famous story of Prophet Ibrahim, who was not asked to kill an animal, he was asked to sacrifice that which was dearest to him. Fast forwarding the plot twist, the ram sacrificed in this instance, representing love and obedience for Allah, serves as a tradition we carry out yearly to mark the end of Hajj. Some scholars say we're actually supposed to be sacrificing something meaningful to us personally or spend in charity. But putting the difference of opinion aside, I'd like to discuss the original sheep. Now, I think it relatively reasonable to assume that this particular sheep, one that was previously grazing in the heavens, was not subject to cruel industrialized farming practices. His feed wasn't polluted with other animal byproducts. He wasn't pumped with growth hormones or antibiotics. He wasn't starved before his death for monetary gain. He didn't have broken limbs due to steroid-induced weight, cramped dwellings, or brutal transportation methods. He was never tied down or caged. He didn't have parts of his anatomy cut off without anesthesia. He didn't stew in his own waist day in and day out. It is relatively reasonable to assume that this ram was not shackled, beaten, tortured, or mutilated. He did not see or hear another being slaughtered. His slaughter did not contribute significantly to climate change. My point is the slaughter of the ram by Prophet Ibrahim cannot be emulated today. It is not the same. The concept of ijtihad is critical thinking. And I wish that my fellow Muslims would stop asking every time they go to a restaurant, is it halal in this sheep-like thought process, pun intended, and start asking what is halal? How did this animal live? What did they eat? How were they treated? How are they transported? How were they tr slaughtered? And was it in accordance with the provisions Islam is very, very clear about? Indisputably clear, in fact. I want them to ask, do I need to eat this? Does this decision of mine harm the environment? Does it harm, does it cause more harm than good? And can I do better? As Muslims, we are explicitly told not to follow tradition blindly and not to do as our forefathers have done. We are supposed to engage and think critically. We are told, do not allow your stomachs to become graveyards. Some Muslims will say they only eat grass-fed animals. The realities of rearing animals for money aside for a moment, some omnicarnist groups also claim that grass-fed, humanely raised local animals are better to consume than flying vegetables and fruits and from afar, and that this approach is carbon neutral, even carbon negative, they say. However, science says otherwise. This is simply not true. It is a very fine science to shuffle the cows on the land and to not trample the grass. So therefore, most grass-fed is not environmentally friendly as people have been tricked into believing. Another famous or popular saying that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is whoever is kind to the creatures of God is kind to himself. And it says in the Quran, and the earth he has assigned to all living creatures. Prophet Muhammad also said, fear Allah in these beasts who cannot speak. It is across the board that when we make a business out of animals, they are treated as commodities instead of the conscious beings that Islam teaches us of. This particular saying by Prophet Muhammad was said when he passed a camel that was emaciated, its back had almost reached its stomach. And that's when he said that. He also said, who, he who takes pity on a sparrow and spares its life, Allah will be merciful on him on the day of judgment. And a man asked 
him, O oh, messenger of God, would we be rewarded for being compassionate towards animals? Our beloved prophet replied, for every living thing, there is a reward. Even though the Quran directs us to eat halal and bayyab, which means pure, our halal meat is often not. Hormones and antibiotics are injected into the animals to prevent disease in their confined quarters. We consume these by extension, inept and cruel living standards, chemical interference, mysterious animal feed. These conditions do not translate into a natural life where animals can roam and eat purely as they please. Often animal feed used in factory farming, as we know, contains animal byproduct. This is also in direct conflict with halal tenants. Haram means it is prohibited for Muslims. In fact, if we don't know that an animal that is slaughtered has ever encountered that which is haram, which is not permissible, we are supposed to err on the side of caution and not engage. Unless we know for sure that all the rules of halal have been followed, we cannot consume that animal product. As Muslims, we have been called upon to be stewards of this earth. How can we participate in meat consumption when it is one of the most wasteful and environmentally damaging industries on our planet? The Quran describes all living things as Muslim in that they live the way Allah created them to live and obey Allah's laws in the natural world. Although animals don't have free will, they follow their natural God-given instincts and can be said to submit to God's will, which is the essence of Islam. One Islamic story that resonated with me the most and propelled me towards animal welfare as a child was one of Prophet Suleiman, who heard an ant's cry. He redirected an entire army for this ant. Prophet Muhammad also sent centuries to ensure a guard and her puppies wouldn't be disturbed as his army passed. I say to my fellow Muslims, remember that our beloved last prophet smiled at everyone, including animals and trees. Let's mimic that compassion. I'd like to reiterate this quote. A good deed done to an animal is like a good deed done to a human being, while an act of cruelty to an animal is as bad as cruelty to a human being. It's kind of a big deal. If you had mercy on the sheep, then Allah will have mercy on you. Thank you so much for your time and attention. I'm happy to take a few questions if I haven't gone over my 20 minutes yet. Thank you so much, um, Sarah. Um, I must say it's been so interesting to hear your and Philip's uh, presentations and also struck by the similarities, of course, uh, when you refer to uh, to basic scriptures um, from Christianity and Islam. Uh, I have, um, first, I would like to ask you in the panel, uh, um, if you have some reflection or question to Sarah. Marie? Uh -huh. You unmuted your microphone, so I thought maybe you wanted to ask something. No. Okay, I have a question from a, a viewer, and it's, of course, it's about halal. Um, um, uh, the transport of living animals uh, from Europe, for example, to different parts of the world. Uh, is there a connection with halal? Uh, to that and in what way? The appetite under, under this halal label, this uh, divine permission that's been given to almost 2 billion people on the planet today uh, means that there is a ton of live export of animals and these, these living conditions. In fact, one of the earlier slides was from one of those live exports from Australia to Saudi Arabia, I believe. Um, the, the conditions under which the animals live simply in itself do not meet the halal criteria. So it is, it is just a simple manipulation of information that is presented to the community today. And the pe people that I hold liable for this today are the community leaders. They, uh, when they give presentations at the mosque, they speak 
so much about uh, the compassion of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. They speak about how animal welfare is important to us, women's rights is important to us, so on and so forth. However, they do not enforce these, these romantic notions. They, they're left and regaled to the past instead of practicing those values today. Uh, Islam's been reduced to simply the rituals, praying, fasting, etc. Uh, giving in charity. The one thing Muslims do really well, in my opinion, is give to charity. Um, it's, it's part and parcel of our religion, uh, but there's very little critical thought. And so therefore, a ton of charity goes to developing countries to give animals as, uh, you know, as, as charity to small communities. It's a bit of a disaster because we all know the climate change implications of that. Very interesting. And as you showed um, during your speech, there is no, um, there's so big support in Islam to um, avoid eating animals. An extraordinary amount, an extraordinary amount of support to avoid eating animals at all costs. And particularly, as I mentioned, if we don't know everything about that animal's life, I don't know one person who can say that they, they, they do when they're consuming halal, halal meat today. Um, if they don't know everything, they, they simply should not be able to indulge uh, because we have to know for a fact that all the halal rules, the, the rules that make it permissible are in fact followed before we're, we're able to eat. Um, but, the, but the fact alone that it says in the Quran repeatedly in so many places that we must avoid uh, causing destruction and corruption on, on planet Earth, it means that, you know, the environmental footprint is, is just, it's too great. And, and there's too much science that supports that, that we, we can no longer deny that it's not just about animal welfare, it's also about the environmental damage and both is, is just not allowed in, in Islam, animal cruelty or the environmental damage.